This is a stream I actually wanted to have uh, a little sooner, but then and my string of uh, old Nintendo games just kept building up, and, well, I enjoyed those, so I ended up putting them off. But now I've finally got a break, or at least I've made a break, so now we get to do a little dueling in the sadly, thoroughly unrewarding uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. Though at the very least, there is a, something to look forward to. Um, since this happened, they've updated their card list, and now I can make my full-powered vampire deck. Can being the operative word. I obviously have nowhere near enough gems or a point, card point, points in order to do so. Let's see, what's the issue? Fixed resolution, uh, effect resolution for a mirror uh, jade, the ice blade dragon. All right, then. And let's see, daily, and what else are you giving me? Ah, oh, the rare 50! Wonderful. I feel so rewarded. Because it takes, like, you know, three months in order to get this up to around 1,000, which is their best chance for getting SR and UR rarity cards. <sighs> anyway... <clears throat> New gates. Uh, one, actually, that is an addition to a previous set of gates. Uh, the, uh, basically, the World Legacy, Crusadia, all that stuff. We now have an additional segment. Aram and his linked comrades, the Crusadia, are up against a new foe, the Orcist, who can be called back from the graveyard even after they are destroyed. One question remains. Who is the mastermind behind these menacing machines? So, we're basically back to the RPG world. Whoa, that is a lot of scenarios set up. That is shocking, really. Anyway, give me the story. The Secret Powers of the Planet. By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet! A few years had passed since that nightmare of a tragedy, literally involving the nightmares. When Aram awoke, he found that the girl and her brother were no longer with him. Was Ib really gone now, for good? The loss of the girl had its grip over Aram's heart like an unbreakable vice. I couldn't protect Ib! If only I were stronger, then her death could have been avoided! The battle had left a chasm in Aram's heart. Now that Ib was gone, Aram had, ta had tasted for the first time just how terrifying a battle could be, and how devastating losing someone you treasured could be. He didn't have to heart to the heart to go on with his journey, not for now. However, there was still one thing on his mind that bothered him. It was Ningursu. Even now, Aram still had no idea where he had gone. No doubt despair had taken him, now that his beloved sister was no more. And when Aram thought how, about how Ningursu must be feeling right now, his heart became fraught with an immovable weight. But that was exactly why Aram had to go after his childhood friend, and so the swordsman resumed his journey with Imduk. It was when Panic was beginning to settle in Aram's mind. Was it coincidence, or did the mech knight that dwelled within him lead him to it? He stumbled across a dormant crawler. It occurred to Aram that this might lead to a clue. He could try and restore it and see if its communication system still worked. Yay, three cards I can't break down at all. Thank you so much, Master Duel. Aram succeeded in restoring the crawler and gained access to its communication system, along with a number of records that detailed areas in which the swarms were active and date on the locations where many crawlers had been destroyed. Perhaps there was still some life left in those areas? And if there was, maybe they would know when, where Ningursu had gone. Armed with this new clue, Aram set off to the areas he had gleaned from the records. However, as useful as the information was, it unfortunately didn't make Aram's expedition any easier. 
There was nary a sign of life to be spotted anywhere, and the journey was looking like it could end in vain. Nature, uncaring and unrelenting, continued to batter the two mercilessly. But at last, a glimmer of hope at the end of the arduous tunnel. Aram and Imduk had stumbled across the remaining tribes of the planet. That of the fiery recluses, the stalwart beasts, and the sacred lakeside trees. Although this encounter brought no clues as to Ningursu's whereabouts, Aram and Imduk were blessed with the legends and knowledge of the tribes. And by linking them together, Aram was able to unlock a, a great secret power of the world and witness the tremendous power that slumbered in its depths. It made him think of the world chalice powers that were bestowed to him. But this was greater, far greater, hiding unbeknownst to the dwellers of the planet. Oh, this is how they're introducing guard dragons? Was this what Lee had sought, Aram thought? Yeah, because these elemental points are what I really need. What were the secret? Uh, well, what were the the more secrets dwelled? Translation team, have another try. One of them was the rebirth records inscribed with the history of the planet, chronicles from generations long forgotten, and the other bygone memories of the planet's glorious age where humans ruled from the apex. Long, long ago, there was a god who ruled the skies. Slifer. With dragonkind as its disciples, it perpetuated the cycles of destruction and rebirth to maintain the balance of the realms. However, the scale of the, of the destruction grew bigger each time, and one day, the balance of the two was thrown into great disarray. Once this delicate balance toppled, even the sacred skies could not hold back the destruction it wrought. The god decided that it could no longer oversee the skies by itself. With its powers of creation, it brought forth layers and layers of the toughest earth and sealed the powers of destruction within. With nowhere to go, the powers raged and raged until it boiled and scorched the very earth, morphing it. The torrents of power rushed through the land and merged with the powers of creation, leaking out onto the surface. It became a small manifestation of the cycle of life of death and rebirth, and gave life to the lands. Spit on the mic. With the last of its strength, the god then turned itself into a key and entrusted it to the life blooming on the planet before vanishing. In the years following its disappearance, the powers of destruction re-emerged on the surface many times. However, every time it did, the life on the planet would use the key and, with the help of the dragonkind, push it back to whence it came. Over time, the key came to be known as a word, and the power of destruction as the great darkness. Thus, the great legend of the world hero was born. Starlit hero, your sword swathed in light. May you triumph over the great darkness. Honestly, I'm quite frankly a bit bored with this. I've never liked the uh, world legacy. E archetype and every one that sprung from it. I would be way more interested if this was a chronicle of all the Albaz archetypes. That would be way more interesting. Decades, centuries, maybe millennia passed since the beginnings of the rebirth records. The land was now populated with life known as humanity. They were a civilization who had gained scientific knowledge and technological know-how and were at the height of their prosperity. Their glory came into cost, for, not only, for it not only tore the planet's gifts away from it, but also the dragons who protected it. The god and the dragons that once were had faded into obscurity as mere tales. And it was during this time that the key was excavated and uncovered. The humans were exhilarated by such a legendary and mystical find. Although its authenticity became gradually acknowledged, some ex expressed worries and doubts at the discovery. What did it mean for the key to have resurfaced in this time? Was this an omen, warning them of an inevitable battle between the world hero and the great darkness, like the legend said? Now that they could see that the key existed in its sword form, 
Did this not also mean that the powers of destruction were indeed sealed deep within the planet's crust? Humanity began to assemble their first, their finest to an analyze the key. Within the team that had formed, there was a scientist who had shown her talent in all fields of medicine, astronomy, and archaeology. Thank you for the following! How do I pronounce that? X here result? Call you. Oh, uh, just X. That works. Her name was Lee. Lee was known all over the world as the foremost authority on computer science. The analysis was able to proceed smoothly thanks to her involvement, and not long after, the team branded itself as an organization called Crusadia, under the jurisdiction of the Confederation of Nations. Once they had analyzed the key further, they began to draft a plan that would help fight the imminent threats to their planet. It would involve warriors of a mechanical nature, and they called it Project Mech Knight. Work was to proceed without a moment's delay. Meanwhile, Lee drew up a hypothesis and sought to validate it in secret. She wanted to get to the root of the appearance of the great darkness that world uh, hero legend spoke of. Recorded in the legend were multiple tales of the key being used to drive back the great darkness by harnessing the powers of creation and destruction. It was a simple enough story. The great darkness would appear, and the world hero would fight it back with the key. However, could the reverse also not be true? That using the key was the very thing that drew the great darkness out? Though there were those who were entrusted with a divine mission, and the conspirators who sought to revive the powers of destruction, the world hero legend was ultimately a story of their power struggle over the key. Whoever has the key will control the fate of the world. Or so went Lee's hypothesis, anyway. And the more time she spent trying to validate it, the darker her ambitions grew. The divine powers will be mine. Ah. <sighs> well, I suppose it is neat to know how all this happened, but again, I'd just rather hear about Albaz. A few years have now passed since Project Mech Knight began, and finally, Mech Knight of the Morning Star was complete. They made Jaegers. It had been fitted with a core powered by the key and possessed enough power to fight the most deadly of wars. However, an incident occurred during its test run with none other than Lee as its test pilot. With the key, she had re reversed all the celestial powers coursing through its mechanical body and diverted them to the planet's core faster than anyone could make a move. Lee had planned all this out before taking her place as test pilot. The power that had flowed into the planet's core split the lands, and once again, the destruction from within overflowed to the surface, scorching every bit of Earth that it touched. The entire world was beginning to split apart in this unprecedented disaster, and the revival of the Great Darkness drew ever nearer. However, its resurrection was not without its obstacles. The Crusadia had created, as assistive units, seven Mech Knights in total. The remaining Mech Knights faced off against Mech Knight of the Morning Star and destroyed it. Sealing away the Great Darkness back within the Earth once more. But the Great Darkness was, at the end of the day, a divine force, one that the mortals failed to seal away completely. Inspired by the key, the team decided to put their powers into physical vessels of their own and left them on the surface as legacies. Now that the lands were ruined, it was getting harder and harder to live in such conditions. It seemed that life on this planet would be gradually snuffed out, including humanity. The reason why the master of the key, the world hero, didn't appear in our time of need is because we humans drained the planet of its powers, thought the Crusadia. They began to mobilize to put an end to humanity's so-called glory, and it was the largest obstacle to the revival of the barren lands and the planet's chances at surviving. They left the seven mech knights they had built in their ruined world after they were programmed with instructions to help rekindle the planet. The mech knights were also installed with data of the Crusadia members they had established a brain link with. If the lands could be healed once more, and the planet could take back the power it once had, then perhaps they could avoid imminent disaster. 
The Crusadia left all their hopes to a faraway future they might not even reach. However, there was one thing they failed to realize. The mastermind behind the incident was Lee, and she had already been taken by the Burning Lands. When she was found, she was already dead. But only in flesh. Her soul had been released from its physical uh, vessel, and she transferred into World Legacy, World Chalice, her will and knowledge. Ah, uh, finally getting close to some actual dueling here. Also, I'd forgotten that Crusadia got more, uh, more support in those. Yeah, uh, well, Vendreds is, well, I wouldn't say it really has lore, since it's mostly just a bunch of horror references. Like Resident Evil, Spawn, The Thing, stuff like that. The tremendous power that dwelled within the planet was the very thing that Lee was after, thought Aram. Suddenly, he was struck by a sense of terror. He could feel a great force of malice that threatened the planet, but from where, he could not tell. Perhaps someone somewhere was beckoning to the darkness, trying to bring it forth. He had to stop them before another terrible disaster happened. And in that moment in Aram's mind, the fig a figure of Ningursu appeared. The figure of his childhood friend, tormented with sadness from the loss of Ib, seeking darkness in his despair at the world. Although, th although slight, he could feel Ningursu's presence within the malice. It couldn't be. Aram reined his uneasy heart in. He would need help to, uh, to stop this malice. He asked the elders of each tribe to lend him their strength. In all honesty, she looks kind of she looks kind of cute though. Oh, it has actual lore. I thought it was mostly that it was just followed like Vendred Slayer that was just mostly meant to be spawn. They named themselves after the warriors of old that their writing spoke of, and thus, the second coming of the Crusadia was born. The Crusadia were taken to a hidden spot by the tribe of the Sacred Trees and activated World Legacy, World Crown. Aram and his companions had now obtained power that could help them combat the malice that threatened their world. The Crusadia began their advance toward the giant tower at the center of all the malice. The orchestrated ba uh, babble, towering into the sky in its me uh, metallic magnificence, surrounding it were the Orcus, mechanical weapons waiting on standby in silent formations. I tried to make a deck of Orcists, but, you know, ever since they banned that one that basically made the deck work, uh, they c it, it really just fell apart and I was like, nah, this ain't worth it. Bug. Ugh. At the tower's base was Ningursu, and activating World Legacy World Wand was the only thing on his mind. Now that Aram could see his childhood friend, the swordsman could only think about how much sadder he looked. Aram prayed that he was only overthinking the situation, but he knew that their reality was not a kind one. Ningursu was here because he wanted the powers of darkness, and he was at the center of the malice Aram had felt. That was the truth that awaited him at the end of his long search. But no matter how much time had passed, no matter how things had changed, the one thing that remained the same was that Ningursu was still his friend. Aram thought about what he could do now that he was here. He had to stop Ningursu from starting a disaster that could mean the end of their world. The only one who can stop this villainy is me, Aram thought, gathering all his courage. He signaled for his companions to mobilize, and now a new battle was about to begin. Finally! Now, time to do the practice, which is almost certainly not actually related to how you play the archetype. Wait, I actually need the card protect- What is this uh, weird-ass nonsense? Let's see. Well, there it is. Alright, fine then. You could have just kept it on the same line. Ningursu's Sorrow. When Ningursu saw what had happened, a bolt of guilt pierced through his grief. Even in his desperation, he never imagined this would happen. His eyes could hardly believe what they were seeing. How did all of this happen so fast? He prayed that he was dreaming and that he was going to wake soon. All he wanted was to see his dear sister again. 
As the scene of another nightmare unfurled around him, he became embroiled in a storm of emotions. I need to save Ib! Even as his mind was numbed with stupor, Ngursu's body began to move without command. In what looked like an impulsive choice, he struck his childhood friend unconscious, taking both the other man's sword and Ib. What good was this world if Ib were not in it? He would do anything, be it good or evil, if it meant that he could see her smile again. That single thought of getting his sister back was all Ningursu needed to force his weary limbs forward. He had the Mech Knight cores from when the Six Nightmares were defeated, and now he also had the sword he took from Aram. Using the facilities that were still present in the Mech Knight headquarters, he analyzed the artifacts with feverish desperation. This world possessed a mystical power similar to that of the world legacies, and if anything had a, a clue regarding its specifics, it would be the Mech Knights. They might even have a way to bring Ib back. Although he was unable to glean a way to resurrect Ib, he learned a great deal about a number of facilities from the ancient civilization. Ningursu left the Mech Knight headquarters and set off to each one of them with the lifeless body of his sister in tow. Revendred Slayer used to be a normal guy until the whole Vendred virus happened. His wife got I killed and he got infected before he was fully transformed. He swore to kill every Vendred. Before he became it, he transformed, but he still got his consciousness and hunger for vengeance. The whole thing happens in a skyscraper from... Whoa. Skyscraper? Whoa. That's quite a... Uh, that's quite a connection. But yeah, for the most part, that's spawn if the T-Virus happened to him instead of a deal with Satan. Many of the facilities he visited had already ceased to work, and the ones that barely did provided little to no useful information. However, Ningursu never gave up. There must be a way he could save Ib somehow. With that unwavering belief in his heart, he resumed his grueling journey. And finally, at long last, he discovered an ancient facility that was still in working condition. One more, one more. I really ought to be rewarded actual points for this. Well, points or gems. I'll take either. After countless weary roads walked, Ningursu had gone through more information than any average man would in his life. He had thoroughly inspected the Mech Knight cores in several ancient facilities. With what he had gathered, including files on the key and technologies thought to be long lost, he had finally unlocked the secrets hidden within the planet. Also, the whole skyscraper isn't just a connection, it's canon. Hmm. I guess the heroes overlooked that one, uh, source of villainy. And the truths of the world had, that had been shrouded in mystery. Ningursu trembled with joy. He could revive his sister now! With his newfound certainty, Ning Ningursu set about creating a vessel that could house Ib's soul using the ancient technologies. However, this task was to be the most difficult yet. Trial after trial resulted in countless failures and their byproducts. And as the days ticked by, he had amassed enough vessels to create his own army. But at last, his efforts paid off. He had finally created a mechanical doll that would work. By synchronizing the doll with the body of his dead sister, he al also succeeded in reinitializing the functions of one of the twin swords vital to his plan. So much time had been poured into this endeavor, but at least there was something to show for it. A strange sense of elation began to bubble within Ningursu. His sister had given her life for this world. Now it was time for him to create a new world for her. Now that Ningursu had the mechanical doll's powers, the second step of the plan to build orchestrated Babel could finally begin. I could finally get to dueling. Ugh, I hope the other gates aren't this long-winded. It could be that the heroes were in another uh, side of Skyscraper, where they were also fighting the zombies, but we got to give the Slayer the, uh, the protagonist role. Yeah, maybe. Oh, it's a force? Oh, now it tells me uh, about these practice things. Just how going second and whatnot. Alright, so how do I not play this archetype? Yeah, yeah, Link summon multiple times. Bloody, bloody, blah. It's a Link spammer. Nobody likes it. Please, please. 
Link summon Crusadia Inquar. Okay, first Crusadia Reclusia. Link material to summon Crusadia Magibus. Special summon Leonis and activate Crusadia Magimus. And Maximus. It would be nice to see a fight between uh, hero uh, like Necro Shade and Slayer. Maybe Necroid Shaman, too. Alright, summon Regulex. Special summon Maximus and activate uh, Regulex. To add Crusadia Revival. Now summon Equimax. Yeah, yeah, activate the field card. Now special summon World Crown, huh? Well, this is definitely better instruction than I got when I had to use crawlers. Ugh, my shoulders. Alright, that's all done. Now I can finally use my own. Alright, what am I looking at here? Looks like pure or looks like Orcist World Legacy. Nope, hold on. Nope, specifically the machine ones. The greatest threat is Orchestrian. I'm gonna use my UAs. Yeah, I'm always chosen to go second, am I? Works for me. I like going second. I get the draw. Pretty weak start. Alright, let's thin the, deck, thin the deck a bit with terraforming. I'll add Hyper Stadium to my hand. Activate it. And add a UA to my hand. Um, yeah, Dreadnought Doctor is a good start. Then, re activate regular stadium. And summon midfielder. Trigger stadium. Mighty Slugger. Swap out midfielder. For Dunker. Direct attack, activate effect, destroy face down. I'll end my turn. Tan Endo. Alright, let's see. You can activate the effects of Orcus monsters in your graveyard or of Link monsters in your control with Orcus in their original names as quick effects. Oh boy. Alright, I'll set penalty box and turn over tactics. And summon midfielder. Uh let's see. Who now? Who now? You know what? Playing manager. Now swap midfielder with slugger. And that will trigger playing manager. Now 
Now, manager, if you would kindly destroy the Tower of Babel. Dunker, pierce it. Slugger, home run. And you run interference. Nice and easy. Sometimes I love the enemy decks. Other times I hate I hate what they loan us though. All right, let's just open these up. I need light energy, huh? All right then. More dark energy? Fine with me. The Crusadia headed toward where Ningursu was. However, before they could reach him, they had to get past the countless Orcus uh, weaponry. The Orcus were merciless, as merciless as they were numerous, and the Crusadia suffered greatly as they tried to fight their way through. In the heat of the battle, Aram began to feel that within orchestrated Babel, there dwelled a, a power similar to that of his key. The mechanical vessels used whatever uh, little of the key's power they had inherited and activated orchestrated Babel. From the depths of the tower, a great light was released, and the tower itself seemed to almost fall away with it as the beam stretched into the sky above. No! The activation must be stopped! Aram thought as he dashed toward the machinery. However, before he could move any further, Ningursu appeared before him. It was the first time they had seen each other since that tragedy long ago. Their eyes met within the chaos of the battle. Aram opened his mouth to speak. Why? he asked. Why would you, uh, uh, would you want anything to do with the Great Darkness? Why put our planet under threat like that? Why did you create this spiraling tower and this army of mechanical weapons? Ningursu had only one simple answer for him. For Ib. It was the only reason he needed. For his sister, he was willing to activate a Babel to strike the world legacy world wand down from the skies and break the Earth's surface so he could awaken the slumbering World Legacy World Arc and use its influence over life and death to revive Ib's soul. Oh, I never noticed that it had that uh, Orcus-like uh, attachment there. You know what, you could almost say it looks like organ pipes that are surrounding it. Then, after the Great Darkness had been freed from within the Earth, he was going to use its powers to resurrect Ib, Ib as a celestial being. Now that he had heard the truth from Ningursu, Aram readied his sword and knew that he had to stop this at all costs. Ningursu didn't budge, and instead swung his lance in return. No one was going to stand in his way, not even Aram. The swordsman knew that Ningursu loved Ib more than anyone in the world. That did not make it right for him to put their entire planet in danger like this. Aram knew that Ib would not want this even if it meant that she could live once more. However, for Ningursu, there was nothing he wanted more than to see his sister open her eyes again, and if it meant that he had to turn against the entire world, then so be it. Both men had already made their minds up on what they wanted to achieve. Neither wanted to budge, and so they clashed, but neither could gain a decisive advantage. The orchestrated babble activated, and at last, the world wand had been toppled. When it fell to the earth, it gored the land below, and the resulting shockwave reverberated across the entire planet. Yeah, that clearly sounds like they're, they're planning on going further into this. Star-studded futures, yeah, no. Okay, let's see. Next up, we have the Bee Troopers! Insect knights, or bee troopers, fight with their own unique tactical maneuvers. I actually tr have tried using bee, uh, bee troopers. I like them a lot, but they're they're a bit funky, honestly. And a lot of times I, I don't have like great or favorable positions with them. But what in the world could their lore be? The Invincible Bee Troopers. In this world, there exist insect warriors who fight and expand their territory with the deadliness of an organized army. They charge onto the battlefield with their trusty bug companions like knights on their steeds. 
These warriors, with their formidable strength and unique battle style, were known far and wide as bee troopers. When they went to battle, they would employ various tactical maneuvers to gain advantage over their enemy. Heading the front lines were Bee Trooper Scout Buggy and Bee Trooper Armor Horn. Bee Trooper Scout Buggy would launch aerial assaults from afar, and Bee Trooper Armor Horn dom dominated land warfare with its impenetrable defense and advancement prowess. Once they got were close enough, Giant Bee Trooper Invincible Atlas, the Bee Trooper's gigantic powerhouse, would swoop in and capture all their targets. These fearsome monsters left no holes in their defense or offense. If push came to shove, they also had foot soldiers that rode on the backs of beetles to deploy. And if any of the uh, troops were injured, Bee Trooper Light Flapper would come rushing to their aid, offering medicine, bandages, and a healing hand. Oh, that's what the role it's meant to play. As strong as they knew they were, the Bee Troopers never stopped strategizing how they would face powerful opponents. The awareness to never let their guard down was what made them such a tough group. So Bug's tough because Bug's tough. Trooper of the Verdant Sanctuary. Summoning Scout Buggy first. Yeah, yeah. Use it and bring out Scale Bomber. Get Armor Horn out first. Whoa, it's got a couple of weird little extra bugs in here. And now for Bee Trooper Descent. Gets a token out. And now we have the big boy. Invincible Atlas. All right, activate tr formation. Summon the trooper. See tribute, scout buggy, special summon to activate Atlas. Okay. Just make sure I got this right. Tribute one insect. Yes. Sting lancer. B Trooper landing. Oh, we're gonna make the fusion! What? You're not gonna let me do it? Come on! Oh, Sting Lancer will go first. Man, this is a real short one. Uh, again, like they really should have chosen some archetype that had more that could have had more story to it. Anyway, my deck again. Honestly, I think my heroes might be able to overwhelm them quickly enough. I 
that reminds me. I should have checked to see if in that recent part, uh, update they had to this, if uh, the Neos support was added. Hmm. Galaxy Worm? Just because it's an insect? Well, it looks like I don't have any opportunity to fuse right now, but I can put that to my advantage. Let's see. And let's see, Verdant Sanctuary was... yep. Add one when uh, monsters destroyed. Well, let's go with Skyscraper first. Let's see. Battle or card effect, okay. Let's put out some bait. <clears throat> Shadow Mist, sweetheart, if you would. Howling Insect. This doesn't seem much like a bee trooper deck. Uh oh. This I did not expect. Ultra B uh, keep trooper absolute Hercules. That's okay. I got this. I got this. Blaze Man. Hercules Beetle. Now that's an oldie. Shinobi Insect. Hagakure Amino. Alright, let me just see. Points to a monster. Your opponent's monsters cannot target it for attacks. You're destroyed by battle card effect, special summon, level one. Now you. Unaffected by other cards' effects until the end of your next turn. Right. End of the battle phase, you can target an insect monster with 3,000 or less. Yeah, this is gonna hurt a bit, but I think I might be able to get out of it. Don't want to give him any more options. Oh, actually, no! I can survive this, easily. Come forth! Elemental Hero Sunrise! And now I add to my hand... Honest Neos! From the graveyard, I will make Nova Master. Why did it ask me twice? For the position. Let's see. Unaffected by other card effects. Yep, which means battle is totally a uh, way to destroy it. But you know what? Let's make it fun. Raigeki! And now I'll use Honest Neos to power up Sunrise. I knew my heroes could do it. Stratos. Unfortunately, I don't need to do anything else but destroy. You'll take enough.
Let's take a look here. Spider Bee Trooper, by the looks of it. About how it looks to me. Um, let's see. For that, my UA will probably have, uh, do. Ugh, okay. Good start, good start. Alright, we'll begin with Libero Spiker. I'll swap him for Perfect Ace. Turn Endo. You know what? I'll stop his uh, buggy right there. I'll discard Midfielder. UA signing deal. Not bad, but not exactly necessary right now. Uh-oh. Yeah, that was like three times I had to confirm. Do you want this? What position do you want this in? Oh. Change all effect monsters on the field to defense position until the end of this uh, turn. The original defense of those becomes zero, and their battle positions cannot be changed. Well, I've got a counter for that. <laughs> swap and swap again. And you know what? Actually, hold on. Yeah, yeah, I'll go with it. Use the Barrow Spiker. Ah, shoot. Flying Sting is their negate card. They made Cicada King. Comes Digital Core Corbage. Detach an XYZ, then target a defense position from monster opponent controls. Shuffle it into the deck. Nope, I'm not letting that happen. Perfect Ace. I'll have to discard. Powered Jersey. You can negate? Well, guess what? So can I. Penalty box. Right? I'll have to use signing deal now. To bring out the better spiker. There we go. Now I've got the lead. You know what? I'll activate it. Ooh, goalkeeper. That's good. Alright, give it the piercing. Ooh, Infernity Beetle. Those are annoying. What? If you only have insects in your graveyard, you can send two face-up defense position monsters to your opponent controls and special summon. Okay. You bitch. 
Alright, monster declares that attack has changed the defense position at the end of the damage step. Not if I- I can stop that, that's easy. Slugger, destroy the spider! And Dreadnought, you do damage to that. To the spider. And then, destroy that. And I'll protect Slugger by putting out Spiker. You know what? I'll abuse it. Those defense position monsters so bad, well, he's not going to get them. Rival Rebounder. A Rival Rebounder will trigger, will give me back one of my uh, graveyard uh, UAs, such as Perfect Ace. Blockbacker, you're not really needed anymore. I'm pretty sure this duel is done. That block spider didn't block anything. Alright, you actually got a challenge this time? Let's see. Oh, God. Preda Plant Bee Trooper? Oh, and it's got Vert Anaconda. You know what? I'm not even going to bother trying. I don't play I don't play against scum like that. Anybody that uses Van Vert Anaconda does not uh, want uh, any fun to happen whatsoever. There were many types of fighters among the bee troopers, and they all brought their own specialized skills to the battlefield. These included beetles who could adopt metal boulder-like forms and other beetles who would carry them into battle. Known as the Bee Trooper Assault Roller, they worked perfectly in tandem. Their drop-and-destroy tactic was extremely effective and could even knock down stone walls. When the Bee Troopers took the fight to barren lands, where it was hard for the foot soldiers to gain advantage, and their uh, flying fire razors would take the spotlight. Bee Trooper Scale Bomber would scatter their flammable scales with lit torches, engulfing their enemies in a burning inferno. Wow, that is probably a war crime. They would take the lead to bring chaos to a wide area of the battlefield. Any targets that were left would be mortally wounded by the poisoned spears of Bee Trooper Sting Lancer. As formidable as every Bee Trooper was, the most attention-grabbing forces would have to be their giant beetles. There was heavy Bee Trooper Mighty Neptune, who devastated enemies from a distance with its cannons and ranged archers. And Ultra Bee Trooper Absolute Hercules, who obliterated all those that stood in its path with an energy blast powerful enough to raise the Earth to nothing. And who could forget Giant Bee Trooper Invincible Atlas, a major key to the Bee Troopers' victories? Whenever the Bee Troopers claimed another su successful battle, the land they fought on would become theirs. Another area would be added to their ever-expanding territory of the vast lands and lush nature that they hungered for. And just like any other day, the Bee Troopers are off again to a new battlefield. They're fun bugs. Now for something kind of cute and kind of fun. The Merry Plunder... We the Merry Plunder Patrol. Now this is like an archetype I have absolutely no... Uh, no experience in. I've not played any of these at all, ever. I just know that they are goblin pirates. We the Merry Plunder Patrol. This is the base of the Plunder Patrol, located in the port town. At the entrance waited a troll, intending to welcome those hoping to join the Plunder Patrol. Welcome, brother! From this day forward, ye be all members of the Plunder Patrol! Ye probably don't know much about the group just yet, but I'll show ye the ropes. The Plunder Patrol's a band of pirates, ye see, and we all take our orders from Captain Blackbeard. 
Now, ye might be thinking we're some no good band of brutes, but we ain't like that, I tell ye. Always a merry bunch, we sail the seas aboard our ship made only made like only we know how. We sail here and there in search of treasure. When trouble brews, we work together and overcome it, and we always share our joy with the whole crew. And anyone uh, and anyone ever does something less than agreeable, we take pride in righting the wrong. That's the Plunder Patrol way. The captain's got quite the appetite, but his belly's a tiny thing next to his big heart. He responds to the crew's selfishness with kindness, even that wicked-eyed bird, Black Eyes, has gotten attached to him. Black Eyes does as the captain tells him. He'll guide the ship along its course or survey the surrounding waters. He may not look it, but he's another valuable member of the crew. Next, I ought to introduce ye to the three biggest names among the crew. First, ye got Whitebeard, an engineer as experienced as they come. Ain't a soul who can mark maneuver the ship like he can. But on rare occasions, and I do mean rare, you see, Sometimes he'll steer us in plumb the wrong direction. That being said, he always gets us where we need to be, when we need to be. It's a real head-scratcher, you know? Then there's Redbeard, our navigator. He's a young'un, but he always keeps us pointing the right way. He's got a loose sense of time, but he's a leader respected beyond his years. And last up is Bluebeard, a mariner and a top-notch technician. He's always designing ships all the time, but from what I heard, he can make just about anything. If there's anything you need made, you can never go wrong with him. Maritime piratal goodness. Here are adorable goblin pirates based on historical figures while also being based on northern ships. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> It's like, a, they're goblin viking pirates. And they got one of the cutest little art styles, probably. Still, they're just not an archetype I've ever actually tried. Also, the main thing is Lincoln synchros. Really? I thought it was that they were more into uh, uh, XYZs. Ah, that sounds like celebratory gunfire to me. The ship must be about to weigh anchor. There's always sure, uh, that's always sure to boost the crew's morale. After setting a new ship out to sea, it's customary for the gang to let the girls sail to a place nearby. Like a little celebratory skip around the pond, you know? That there's Bluebeard's latest ship, the Lease. She's got loads of space for anyone aboard, as well as a cargo hold for bounties of treasure. A real beauty, ain't she? She ain't the only boat that stays afloat, but it don't hurt to know, uh, know the best. That ship with the horns, the Bran, she's nothing to sneeze at either, what, uh, with her speed and cannon power. If you're looking for a short trip on a sunny day, she's your gal. Best stock up on fuel first, though, with the way she guzzles it. And that, and that, and then that black ship over there is the Mork. That's the one, uh, you look to if you need to sail under the cover of darkness. Not that it makes sailing a pitch black sea an easy task, just to be clear. Still best to work alongside other ships. Speaking of which, we sing out real loud, like, to let each other know, know each other's positions. Nah, stupid digital bugs are... I know those are XYZ, but I could have sworn that one of the ships, or at least two of them, were, X, were XYZ. Huh? What? You can't really go unnoticed in the dark if you're singing, right? Don't be such a curmudgeon, brother! Sure, the sea can be a scary place, full of all... All sorts of dangers, but still, we go out to meet the waves, jovial as can be. Well, I guess that means they never go out singing Bones in the Ocean. And no matter how smooth the sailing, the captain's always got a plan B in case things turn sour. The captain cares dearly for his comrades. We wouldn't do it any other way. By the way, we'll be here till the ship comes back to port. Always got to make sure things are clean and ready for a feast. So there's plenty to do, brother! All right, how do these little fellas work? The Plunder Patrol, Fusion, Synchro, and XYZ monsters have effects... Oh, they're a multi... Uh, they work on all of them, okay. 
have effects that help you keep the upper hand, such as by interfering with opponents and supporting the deployment of allies. They also have effects that can be activated even during the opponent's turn as long as they're equipped with a Plunder Patrol card. Be sure to take advantage of the effects of Plunder Patrol monsters that allow them to be treated as equips. Plunder Patrol Party! Golden Hair, the newest Plunder Patrol. Well, she's cute, but she's no honey goblin, I'll say that. <laughs> see, just summon her normally? Alright then. Special summon Bluebeard when you have at least a pl one Plunder Patrol. Excluding ones with the same name. Alright, now summon Blackbeard. Captain on deck! Use the effect of Bluebeard Plunder Patrol Shipwright that was sent to the graveyard as Link Material. So we'll discard. Party! Now we've drawn Whitebeard. Now we've used the effect of Golden Hair. Now that Whitebeard uh, has been sent to the graveyard, you can activate its effect. Special summon Redbeard from the deck. Use Redbeard as Synchro Material. Thunder Patrol Ship Bron coming out. Over the sea, let's go, men. We're shoving right off, we're shoving right off again. Alright, so now use. Redbeard. I'll just equip to that. And Plunder Patrol Party. If you special summon a Plunder Patrol monster from the extra deck while this card is in your graveyard, you can special summon. No, you can equip this card to that special summon monster as an equip card with the effect that it gains 500 attack points. Just, it just counts as an equip, doesn't Alright, the bullet goes first. And now, the captain gets the finishing blow. Well, now I may want to try to make a deck for them in, in Ignis. Anyway, let's see. All right, it's Plunder Patrol mixed with a couple of cheap cards and a little bit of maritime nonsense. Anyway. Let's change from UA to my Warrior 5. Let's take a look here. Plunder Patrol monsters you control gain 500 attack for each Plunder Patrol card in your spell and trap zone. 
You can discard a card, add a Plunder Patrol from your deck to your hand. If this card is in your graveyard, target a Plunder Patrol card in your Spell and Trap. Set this card, if you do, return that one to the hand. Wow, this is a real hint. That's a real bouncy archetype. And sweep. Ah, it was party. Anyway, I will discard King of the Swamp. Next, I'll activate Polymerization. Actually, shoot, I did that wrong. Well, whatever, it'll work. Diffuse Kaiki the Unity Star and Kuro Obi Karate Spirit. Into Idaten the Conqueror Star. Upon fusion, Ida 10 will let me add level 5 monster to my hand. That will be Hayate the Earth Star. When I control a light earth, uh, a light warrior, I can summon him free of tribute charge. I'll leave them as they are now. When Ida 10 attacks, it can reduce the attack points of any level 10 or lower monster to zero. Yeah, real smart. What a dumb, uh, what a dumb computer. Anyway, now then, final move of the turn. Monster Reborn. Summon Kaiki. And use its effect. For 500 life points, I can fuse. And I shall make... The Unstoppable Shura! The Combat Star! And end my turn. Kage Tokage. Going for a cheap level 4. Shura's effect activates. All monsters on your side of the field at the time uh, have their attack points reduced to zero. Afterwards, during battle, each monster gains 200 points times their level. And at level 12, Shura can't be beat. Turn Kudo Obi to my hand. And unfortunately, Shura is no good at attacking directly, so end my turn. Oh, unexpected die to summon the Fire Kraken. Boy, you really just don't learn. <laughs> Grand Voyage of Surprises, you just oh, seem to keep getting surprised by Shura. Needs light energy, which I don't have. Aw, that's cute. Hey, looks like the lease made it back safe and sound. Captain looks to be in high spirits. That means good results if I had to guess. And we're all set here. The waiting party's ready for the banquet to begin. A feast to celebrate a successful voyage, the best part of the whole thing. As far as the banquet is concerned, it doesn't matter who's coming back from the voyage and who's been here the whole time. It's a time for us all to share good fortunes. Oh, the captain's calling for the apprentice. Suppose the kid's a full-fledged member of the crew now. Huh? What do you mean? Well, you see, when the plunder patrols are recognized as full-fledged uh, full members, we receive a spyglass from the captain. For us, that one possession is as important as our very lives. It's more than just some tool for navigation. It's proof that the captain sees us as his comrades. 
That kid'll be more zealous to be a part of the Plunder Patrol than ever before. Here's wishing you luck. Uh, here's wishing you luck earning a spyglass of your own someday. Do your darndest. I ain't even got mine yet. <laughs> okay, that was a cute little uh, end to it. Mm. Nope. Uh, you know what? Why not take a break at the moment? Uh, at least just to take a look and see if what I what I want is uh, actually in the game now. As well as collect on this. Oh, 40 points? Wow, aren't I lucky. The game is just so generous. Okay, let's see. I'll just take a look in here. Okay, so... Neos. Nope, that's a shame. Doesn't look like they've added the newest Neos cards. Too bad, that's one of my most favorite decks to play nowadays. What else was I thinking of? Oh, I know. Todoroki. Yep, as I thought. If Neos isn't added, then surely the newer, the newer level five like warrior monsters, uh, star warrior monsters aren't added. Of course. All right then. Back to it. The tribe of the abyssal waters, the mermail. I have actually used these some in these a bit. They're, uh, not bad. Sheesh, only an hour? Thought this would have been longer. Anyway, the tribe of the Abyssal Waters. Lemuria, the Forgotten City. Once a beautiful and thriving hub, this city had been built with advanced technology and boasted a rich culture. However, an unforeseen seismic shift that shook the entire continent caused it to sink to the bottom of the ocean. And now, a group of creatures called the Mermails have taken up residence in the ruins of the once prosperous city. These aquatic creatures were ruled by a benevolent royal family and lived under the ocean in peace, hidden from the rest of the world. These merfolk loved to sing and would often offer their songs to the god of the sea, praying that their daily lives would remain protected and peaceful. Many of the singers were adults, like Mermail Abyss Lind, but not all of them. Some were young, like Mermail Abyss Dine, but that didn't mean their singing was any less beautiful. All of the, these merfolk played important roles in offering their prayers. At first glance, they would appear to be a gentle and graceful group without a single harmful bone in their bodies, but that was far from the truth. In fact, within them dwelled a great power that they weren't afraid to use when worse came to worst. The Mermail Warriors had weapons that they used whenever they patrolled the waters or hunted for food. One such warrior was Mermail Abyss Pike, who fought with a unique hand-to-hand -hand combat style that performed excellently underwater. There was also Mermail Abyss Sturge, who wielded his chained harpoon with great dexterity. These warriors trained and fought bravely to ensure the, sa the safety of their people. The Mermails were a nomadic tribe, and they had traveled many miles to find a safe place they could call home. This lifestyle gave rise to their fearsome battle capabilities and skill. Well, that's not much. I was kind of hoping there would be a little more. Especially considering there's still the, uh, the uh, big Mermails. That look like whales and sharks and whatnot. Instead, they're just covering the level threes and fours. Ooh, now this is pretty. Let's see what happens. Hold on. Yeah, like Abyss Megalo. Why didn't they mention that? I know how to use these. I want to see what happens. Fishy! Colorful fishy. Alright. Special summon Abyss Megalo by discarding Lind. 
and gunned. Really? It gets its own unique card artwork? It's just Abyss Megalo. Alright, Abyss Megalo. Add an Abyss Spell and Trap from the deck to my hand. And then Abyss Gun will activate. To summon Abyss Lind. Ah. Abyss Scale of the, of the Mizuchi. Ah, double attack. The Dark Magician was perfectly comfortable being underwater. Must have a water breathing spell. Let's switch it up a bit and actually use the loner deck. Let's see, what is the opponent using? Looks like Shark Mermail to me. And what will they and what are they letting me have? Pure Mermail. Just how I like it. That's personally how my own Mermail deck is built, although it's certainly built better than this. Not a great start. Starting with Umiruka. Let's see, banished from the graveyard, which means it's not doesn't mean anything above. Let's see. And that's just to, uh, to facilitate. Okay. So, let's start with uh, Mermail Abistius. Discard Abyss Pike. And summon. You add a level 4 or lower mermail from the deck to my hand. You know what? Let's do that. Let's see. Do, 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 do. I'll go with Abyss Lung. Which I will then summon. Next. Wait, hold on. Ah, a level 3 or lower. I discarded a level 4. And let's see. Uh, Cestus. That, this one negates trap effects, and this one will negate monster effects. Well, since Abyss Lung is the force target, might as well give him a little extra firepower. There you go. Not exactly smart for him to have that Yumi Ruka on the field, since we... Yumi Iruka on the field, I, I should say. Because we both take advantage of it. Ah, now I have Mizuchi. I've got all of the Abyss Scales. Alright, Abyss Dias, take a peek. As I thought. Abyss Nose. I have the greater command of fish. I am the real Aquaman! Another Abyssius. No point in using him, though.
Who's the real predator of the deep now, eh? Oh, and there's my third Abistius. I would say this is when loner decks are at their best. Other times it's like they come up with the worst matchups possible. Like your opponent will have World of Darkness Danger while you're stuck with Danger Karibo and the two just do not work in the slightest. And I got Spined Gilman for my troubles. I could open up because it uses water. Alright, let's see. Looks like it's continuing with Mermail Shark. Oh, nope. Specifically, Shark, uh, Mer shark Rank Up, I see. And what do they give me? Mermail Marine Cess? That's not a good mix. They don't even give me the one, um, like, like Marine Cess Link Monster that actually works with Crystal Heart. Just give me Great Bubble Reef. Well, I'll give it a shot. Am I always going first, or is this just how it decides? And already, this isn't a good start. Let's see. The best I can do is uh, start with Abistius. Discard Seahorse. Special Summon in Defense and Activate Effect. Which again, only adds Mermails. No, he wouldn't do anything. Let's see. Abisturge. Now, let's see if I can have one that uh, gets destroyed by battle a little. Let's see. Sent from the field to the graveyard, draw a card, then discard a card. Nope, that's not what I want. Abyss Hilled. Sent to the graveyard, special summon a mermail from your hand. Nope. Abyss Dine. Added from your deck or graveyard to your hand by a card effect. Special summon. Must control a mermail to, you know, hmm. No, that still wouldn't help me, I think. Well, I'll give it a try, actually. Abyss Dine. Onto the field with you. Oh. Okay, they're actually not that exclusionary. All right. Let's see. I'll set Scorn and Wave. I think I can actually work with this. Hold on. Let me let me just recheck Seahorse. During your main phase, except the turn this card was sent to the graveyard. Banish from the graveyard. Special summon a water from your hand. Nope. What's the best I can do here? Abyssalatia. Send a card from your hand to the field, add a mermail from your deck to the hand. Destroyed, but send a water from your deck to the graveyard, then target a water monster in your graveyard, special summon in defense. That might just be the best th option I have, honestly. Ah, wait, nope, 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 that's right, that's right, Coral and Enemy. I can do this. I've worked with Mar Marine Sets as well. All right, special summon. Seahorse. See, what, Link summon target a marine cess. Add it to your hand. No, that's not. That's not it. Link summon. Add a marine cess spell from deck to the hand. Actually, no. Yes, I do need that. That's right, I need to use all the lower level ones I can. So, here we go. Battle Ocean. Hmm. 
Now, I need to, let's see here. That's not what I want. Yeah, I think Marble Rock is what I want to do. There. And now, let's see. Sent for the field to the graveyard. Target a marine cess in your graveyard. Add it to the hand. I can do that. Yes, I still haven't used Seahorse's effect yet. And now... Battle Ocean will activate. Which will equip Coral and Enemy and Sea Angel to Marmold Rock. Right? Special summon her. And now I can make Great Bubble Reef. And the, one of the, their bosses is now out. And I can give her three equips. And here is where I need to be right back in just a bit. Okay, and before I end my turn, let's I need to do a quick re-review of my cards. Let's see. Marine Cess Wave. Target a face-up monster your opponent controls and negate that monster's effects until the end of the turn. You can control a link to or higher Marine Cess. All face-up monsters are unaffected by opponent's card effects. If I control a link three or higher, I can activate it from my hand. Well, I already said it, so let's see. Bubble Reef. In each standby phase, banish a water monster from my graveyard or the field draw card. Each time a monster is banished, this card gains 600 until the end of the turn. Send a water monster from the hand to the graveyard. Special summon a banished marine cess. Okay. 
And then Battle Ocean. All Marine Cess gain 200, and each one gains 600 for each Marine Cess equipped to it. Monsters in my extra zone that were linked summoned using Crystal Heart are unaffected by your opponent's card effects. Damn it! Should have gone with that. Well, actually, I don't think I could have. Well, oh well. When you link summon a Marine Cess, uh, you can equip up to three Marine Cess link with different names from your graveyard. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, I think I'm in a pretty good position. I might as well. Let's see. I can recall banished Marine Cess, so I might as well just banish the only Marine Cess I have. Actually, wait. Nah, I've already... I, I can't use... I've already activated the effect. There's no going back. Hammer Shark. Reduce the level of the card to one and special summon in level three or lower water. You know what? Just to mess with them. No. Huh? White Stingray. Oh, that's a free special summon. Silent Honor Arc. Oh, hell no. I ain't letting that happen. Let's see. You know what? Might as well. Oh wait, nope, that was the uh, not the effect I wanted to use. Oh well. Bye Abyssin. Hey, there's Seahorse. Discard Abyss Hilled. Special summon Seahorse. Again. Oh, right, she couldn't summon herself. I have an idea on what to do. Hold on, no. I'm, yeah, I'll leave it as is. Cancel. Alright, I'll activate Abyss Scorn. Give Hill some firepower. And let's go take it out. Abyss Spear. Ooh, clever. Very clever, very good. But, won't be enough. Now then, let's see here. Add a Marine Cess spell, that's not what I want. Let's see, target a Marine Cess in your graveyard, add it to the hand. And only special summon water monsters. Oh, actually. Let's see, when your opponent targets exactly one face-up mermail you control with an attack or spell or trap effect that could have targeted it, attach an XYZ and that effect now targets this card. Card is destroyed since a graveyard, target a mermail in your graveyard, special summon. I don't know, just in, case, just in case it feels like to me. I'll just, I'll banish Abyss this time. Hey, Blue Tang! And Pascalus. Okay, normal special summon, send a marine cess from the deck to the graveyard. 
Almost well, special summon. Special summon a marine's test from your hand in defense position. Okay, let's go. Pascalus, you do it. Ling out. Ling out. Bring out Tang. Let's see. I'll use Mandarin. I may have the field advantage, but I haven't been able to break through for any to cause any damage yet. I think I'll be able to. Graveyard is Link Material. Excavate the top three cards. If you do, add an excavated Marine Cess to your hand and shuffle the rest into the deck. Fine with me. Butang, Pascalus, and Abyslung. Wait, hold on. Oh, that's right. I already used Marble Rock as... Well, whatever. Well, their defenses are low. I think I could get away with some damage. By at least flooding, haha, <laughs> the field. Okay. Uh oh. Abystius. I'm wearing down their cards, but still no damage. This is a bit inf annoying, honestly. No, I will not use Bubble Reef. Lancer Shark. Da 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 da. Nope, Lantern. I'm sick. Oh, again with Honor Arc? Really? Target a Marine Cess in the graveyard. Add it to my hand. Yeah, I'll return Marbled Rock, because I just lost my boss. Okay, time to do this properly, I think. Crystal Heart. None seem to match. Summon Pascalus. All right, let's free Bubble. Let's let's free Bubble Reef from there first. Treat her as two materials, and Coral and Enemy will be the single.
Okay, let's start Battle Ocean. And then one coral and enemy. Great Bubble Reef will return to the uh, extra deck. And now for the equipment. Coral and enemy. Sea Angel. And Crystal Heart. And just to remind myself, let's see. When opponent's monster declares an attack, send a Marine Cess from your hand to the graveyard. For that battle, monsters can't be destroyed by battle and take no battle damage. Oh, also free target to add a Marine Cess to the hand. You know what? Get back in there. Do a little recycling. Of course you would, but that leaves you wide open. Luke Tang. Oh, whoops. Oh, well, no, she works. Let's see, main phase, you can banish this card from the graveyard, target a marine, says spell or trap in the graveyard, add to the hand. You know what? That's highly valuable at this point. Give me wave. Puny shark. Oh, I can even just add this freely. In that case, all right, finally time to go on the offensive. What the heck? Did I just lose a uh, connection with the chat for a moment there and then just reloaded? Be surprised if it did. And done. That took a while. That's mostly the nature of the marine cesses. What's the opponent using? Oh, God! Gradle Abyss? Yes. Uh, Gradle Mermail. Oh, God. That's disgusting. Oh. Oh, God. That's sick. That's really, really sick. What do I get to use? Penguin a bit. A penguin mermail. You know what? To t combat, uh, that's actually not that bad to combat, um, Gradle. Gradle, uh, auto-equip when they're destroyed. So, if they're just constantly sent back to the hand, there's not a problem. Also, Trishula. <laughs> uh, what a bastard you were. Anyway. That'll be that for that. That's the end of that. I'll probably just get try that later. Oh, you know what? I should have done this like Attenborough. A big reason for their survival was the leadership of their royal family. The queen who currently oversaw the tribe was Mermail Abistrite. In their pursuit of a peaceful life, they were not always able to avoid battle, and some of them have been quite devastating. However, they were able to pull through with the support of their queen and her guards. At their helm was Mermail Abyss Megalo, who fought with a large saw with teeth like a shark's and promised safety to his people with his gallantry. However, protecting the merfolk was not all, all the royal guards did. They had been entrusted with a secret mission. 
They were also protectors of the treasures of the Mermails, the Abyss Scales, three suits of armor with powerful magic imbued within, and a certain golden bracelet. The golden bracelet was so famous that even the regular Mermail citizens had heard whispers of it. Legend says that the golden bracelet is so mighty that it can take over the world. Whoever wears it will obtain enormous power and will become ruler of the Mermails. The only one who knew the specifics of the bracelet's power and its whereabouts was Queen Abistrite. To this day, the bracelet is still shrouded in much mystery. Queen Abistrite prayed that she would never have to unleash the powers of these uh, secret treasures. After much wandering, the Mermails would finally arrive at Lemuria and call it their safe haven and home. The treasures and their fearsome powers stayed hidden, and the mermaids spend their days peacefully. And so, for now, the queen was able to rest easy. <laughs> Ugh. Now I have water. Yeah, yeah. No. And that's all the new stuff they've got. And I don't even get any more gems. Uh, this gem system really has been quite awful. Like, the generation, the system that generates the cards is good, but my, from a player perspective, it just seems... It's just so... So disgustingly gotcha. You just have to spend money and money and money on these points so that you can get the 10 packs to get the highest chances of SRs and URs to break down for their card points to then build up your decks. Like, I'm surprised that as cheap as I've been, I've been able to build three decks, three complete decks in total. And one of the... Well... Yeah, three complete decks in total. And this one, I would argue, is still not done. Because it's not, not as good. It doesn't have the extra decks cards that my Ignis deck does. But, like, UA and E-Hero, these are about as complete as they can be for the time. E-Hero, really, the only support I could add to that would be, like, Favorite Contact. Um, wake Up Your Elemental Hero. And, what was it? Um, EN Shift, I believe. Basically, just a few, uh, just a few cards released with the new Neo support. Ugh. Ah Hell sneezer. My blue eyes deck is semi-complete, but it's definitely not a deck I would want to really have or use. Everything else I've got planned is just requires so many high rarity cards. It just doesn't. It's so tiring, and it's just I don't even know know why I bother logging in like or trying to remember to log in every day just for 30 measly gems. It's just... There's got to be better rewards. And I don't do online play because I'm sure it's swamped with people who are that just have the most broken meta decks possible. The one time I tried and actually won, that was probably a complete fluke. That, he would, uh, he, that his like Red Eyes deck just didn't seem to be working uh, well. No, it was a Gaia deck that wasn't... A Gaia the Fierce Knight deck that wasn't working well, and I just happened to steamroll over him before he could do anything to get to me. It's just... I can't trust on other online players, really. So, it's sad that the only content I'm able to squeeze out of this is the solo... The new gates that come every few months or so. It's really disheartening, because this is definitely the best card, gen card acquisition system of all Yu-Gi-Oh games I've played so far. But the free simulators just beat it out because they're updated much faster, er, er, and they just, again, because it's free, you're just able to look up the cards, put them in a deck, there you go, test them against some AI or other people. It's that simple. Yeah, well, uh, anyway, I think yeah, I'm never able to get much out of the stream, so that'll be the end for today. I do have to work on tomorrow's stream particularly anyway. It's an emulator, which means there's probably going to be some button glitching and whatnot that needs to be fixed before starting it. And quite frankly, I'm going to need the time right now, so... <coughs> so, that'll be all for tonight. Please follow if you liked. 
Thanks for watching. Peace be with you. And may the forces of evil be confused on the way to your home. Oh, that's right. I need to see if there's anybody to bother. Nope. Actually, no. Nobody to raid. Alright. Bye then.